definitely bring my husband to these things. <laughs> thank you very much. That was such a nice introduction. Thank you, Becky. And thank you for all that you do for our school. So welcome back, or welcome for the first time. You've heard about the, uh, the all-school convocation. I just wanted to, you to see a picture of it, in case you haven't seen it already. Someone took a pan of, uh, let's back it up. There's one more. Uh, that's all right. That's all right. We'll just, we'll just go on. So uh, uh, the, you know all about the first ever all-school convocation. Uh, it was a beautiful thing to see, that's for sure. Um, so for those are, of you who are with us for this t first time, know that tonight's event is a bit of a State of the Union address. I uh, call it the State of the School. Uh, some news and updates, progress reports, plans for the year, and then some uh, thoughtful commentary. Uh, both Rick Commons and I will reflect a bit on teaching and learning about school in general and our school in particular, and hopefully convey to you why we love doing what we do. So let's talk about the class of 2013. And this is not that class, but that's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that class eventually. That's the class of 2014. So first, a report on the 286 members of the class of 13. We launched them last June, and now they're all happily moved on to their next learning experience. Our uh, upper school deans compile an official college admissions and matriculation report uh, at the end of the school year, and nearly all those statistics go into other reports, which uh, you can see at some point. But I'm just going to highlight a few things about that class. First of all, the, the first line in the report is, 2013 was a very good year for college admission at Harvard-Westlake. So the 286 members of the class of 2013 are enrolled in 86 different colleges and universities. Uh, a record number of students were admitted early, which often meant to their first choice school. Greater than ever geographic diversity in the choices that they're making. Notably, more kids are applying to schools in the South and uh, the Midwest, including my beloved Michigan. Uh, the number enrolled in small liberal arts colleges was twice what it had been the year before, which was interesting. That's, that's a good thing, I think. That's a, that's a small liberal arts colleges are good. More students applying to schools outside the US. Now, this is still a, a small number, but know that this year, three of our, our um, last year's graduates are studying in Great Britain and one in France. Average SAT scores were as high as they've ever been in verbal and math and writing. Uh, I, what we are proudest of are the high scores that our students earn on the writing portion of the SAT. Surely the most difficult to prep for. It's you can't really uh, use a Kaplan SAT book to get better at writing. One learns to write well over a long, long period of time. So over and over again, we hear from our former students that the greatest advantage they realized as college freshmen was their ability to write well, cogently, persuasively, with insight and passion. They are universally and vocally grateful for this gift. The headline actually in this morning's Chronicle of Higher Education reported the findings of a recent Northeastern College study. Any of you who are employers, this won't surprise you, but here it goes. Employers favor graduates who can communicate. <laughs> Nine members of the class of 2013 are opting for a gap year, which is interesting. They are accepted to college last spring, and then they're in choo choosing to defer for a year so they can intentionally do something, something else. And the something else is often really interesting. Several are volunteering their time in service to others. They're doing conservation work or community service, sometimes in this country, sometimes in other countries. Uh, one alum plans to, be, plans to be an AmeriCorps volunteer. One aiming for fluency in a second language will spend a year in a language immersion program. Uh, two are actually gonna work for a year. Uh, with full-time jobs that for the experience, for a break, and to earn some extra money for college. Two are recipients of Brownstein Fellowships. Those are grants awarded to the school by to encourage meaningful gap year experiences. One Brownstein recipient who will travel and study in Asia this year wrote this in his application. I'd like to enter college a more mature, balanced person who has caught up on at least some of the things on my to-do list and has a broader understanding of the world. So it almost sounds like he's ready for college, but he's gonna take a year off. <laughs> so I don't wanna to dwell too long on college placement, but here's a story I just, I had to share. Last spring, a friend handed me an article from the Yale Alumni Magazine. So the title was, Yale's Top Feeder Schools 
then and now. It was a short piece that illustrated how much college admissions has changed over the past half century, and it included a really nice surprise. So here's the graphic from the then particle, part of the article, okay? So this is Yale's top feeder schools 50 years ago. Uh, 50 years ago, Yale admitted nearly 700 of its students from just five schools. So then to, to quote from the narrative that accompanied this graphic, if you were in the Yale College class of 1957, there was a 20% chance that you went to one of five particular schools. So then that article goes on to say, today there are some new names on the list of the top five Yale feeder schools. <laughs> so um, Harvard Westlake is at the top of the list. <laughs> But again, yeah, okay. <laughs> but again, you know, notice the difference. And I, I, I didn't do this just to show you that Harvard Westlake was at the top of the list, which of course is good news. But um, if you, you know, if there's going to be a list. Why not be at the top, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, is that you you see now that uh, far, far, um, actually only about four percent of the. Um, of the students now at, in, the, in the class of 2007 came from those top five schools. So it, it really has changed uh, dramatically. Clearly things have changed, but given the extraordinarily competitive nature of selective college admissions, the top spot on this particular list is a notable achievement. Okay, let's look at senior ceremony. Oh, all right, so we'll just, you know what, we'll, we'll just go, go back, J.D., please. There we go. All right, so there's senior ceremony. Here they are, so now I wanna talk about the class of 2014, all 291 of them, four days ago, Sunday evening. Annual senior ceremony, the choir sang, the prefects made speeches, and in a ceremony that originated at the Westlake School for Girls, each senior was called individually to receive a class ring or a pin, and by inference, assume the mantle of leadership, the responsibility that comes with being a senior. It's a very sentimental and meaningful day. Lots of photos and hugs and misty eyes. And that's not the kids crying, but rather you know, moms and dads recognizing, wondering where all the time has gone. A week ago, we received the news that 53 of these students, or about 18% of the class, were named National Merit semifinalists. In all likelihood, all of them will be finalists. Students qualifying, qualifying for the National Merit students qualify for the National Merit uh, uh, as National Merit semifinalists on the basis of their PSAT scores. So we don't design any of our courses to explicitly prepare kids for the PSAT, but because they've been taught well, taught to read analytically, to solve a wide variety of math problems, to build upon prior knowledge constructively, to think on their feet, they do really well on those standardized tests. Just to put this into some perspective, about 1% nationally of all students taking the PSAT get this sort of recognition. Um, at Harvard Westlake, it's 18%, so it's almost one in five. And notably, 21 of our National Merit semifinalists are girls. So smart girls are in good company at Harvard Westlake. <laughs> They're surrounded by other girls and boys who work hard and enjoy learning classmates who are ambitious and at the same time exceedingly supportive of each other. To that point, I'd like to read from an email I just received from Mike Beats, who is our head debate coach. So this is from Mike. This is just the beginning of the, of the big debate season. Uh, so entering this season, we are in a rare situation, like a historically rare situation. We have five, and he's got that in capital letters, five returning debaters who competed at last year's Tournament of Champions. The Tournament of Champions is like the Olympics. Only about 80 debaters qualify to the Tournament of Champions in any given year, nationally 80. We have five seniors, and I think we're in for a great season for the five of them. I'm really hoping they can look back and see that they were part of something really special and that they can really love each other this season. Four of the five have been on the team together since seventh grade. Then Mike continues, I want to mention that we continue to be one of the few teams in the country that has very successful girls at national level competition. Three of the five returning TOC competitors are girls. At last year's TOC, only 13 of the 80 competitors were girls. So three of them are ours. 
We had three of the 13. It is a great source of pride for me and my team that we are a leader in this area, so says Mike. So my, my words now, uh, there are many good schools, great schools for girls in this city, and Harvard-Westlake is one of them. All right. That would be Albert Einstein there, and that is what he said. So I'm going to move on from statistics and now tell some stories, because often what cannot be counted counts even more. Our new seventh graders um, we're just getting to know our, so I wanted to talk about three classes, last year's senior class, this year's senior class, seventh graders. We're just getting to know our new seventh graders, but um, what I can tell you now is that they are all above average and they are all good looking. <laughs> <laughs> at about this time last year, we announced our plan to adopt a one-to-one -one computer model at the school to ask our students to bring their laptop computers to school every day. A lot of thought and planning preceded the decision and myriad resources are being devoted to making sure that we do this really, really well. Our goal is to ensure that our students are prepared to use technology effectively for learning while at Harvard-Westlake and beyond. Every day we are adding additional teacher-developed resources to our school's learning resource website, The Hub, and finding creative ways to use online resources in our teaching. It may not seem like this yet, but backpacks are getting lighter. <laughs> I, mentioned, <laughs> I mentioned this in the context of my report on the class of 2019 because those students are our pilot program class. Although any student can bring a computer to school, and, and actually many of them do, only seventh graders are required to do so. So next year it will be all middle school, and then after that the entire school. So technology integration is being done really thoughtfully. Uh, librarians uh, at the middle school made a really clever game last week out of a library research project that had seventh graders aiming their borrowed iPads at QR codes located all over the library, and then each code translated to an answer to some question about library resources. Every day during activities period, two teachers staff a dedicated help desk in the lunch area. So students in all grades can use their computers for in-class note-taking or writing assignments or, or not. There are times when a computer is the best tool for the job and there are times when a colored six-sided cube that can be manipulated by hand is preferable. Middle school teachers, all of whom have participated in technology integration workshops, are making well-informed decisions about the best tools for their assignments. In visual arts, students learn to digitally enhance photographs uh, to create art, and they also do blind contour drawings by hand, just the way that you and I learn to, to, to do that, to unite hand and eye. Go ahead, one more. There we go. Um, some kids like to read from a screen. Many, when given the choice, prefer a paper book. While increasing our use of online resources, we remain ever mindful of the great value of uninterrupted conversation among humans. There are still in-class discussions and sharing. S youngsters still present their ideas verb verbally and are encouraged to come out from behind the screen and socialize. To facilitate that balance, the middle school lunch area remains a no electronics zone. Have a conversation instead is what it says. Go ahead, JD, one more. There you go. Uh, indeed. So then a related story. Over time, online textbooks will replace the heavy hardback variety, and it was inevitable that one day someone would think to create a cell phone app that mirrored the Harvard Westlake Daily Planner. One more, okay. The day is here, and the clever app inventor was one of our students, actually, 12th grader Jonathan Burns. On Monday of this week, we announced Jonathan's gift to the school and invited all students, middle and upper school, to download easily and at no cost their own Harvard Westlake Planner mobile app. The, I love the tagline here, manage your school life from your phone. <laughs> Congratulations and thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> manage your life from your phone, should it be so easy? Would it be so easy? That would be nice. Um, now some stories about kids and their teachers. Uh, honestly, at this school, there's a great story to be told every single day, but I'm just going to tell a few of them. The middle school news magazine, Spectrum, was named a National Scholastic Press Association Pacemaker finalist, uh, the winner to be announced in November, so stay tuned. 
The pacemaker is considered the highest honor a school publication can receive, often referred to as the Pulitzer Prize of student journalism. The Chronicle, the Upper School Chronicle, uh, the National Scholastic Press Association honors outstanding work by individual reporters and writers. Chronicle Man managing editor Sarah Novikoff's wonderful piece about financial aid at Harvard Westlake is a finalist for the story of the year. Stay tuned. The Columbia Scholastic Press Association recently awarded the Chronicle a gold medal, its highest ranking. Praising the paper's top-notch writing and reporting, the association awarded 967 out of 1,000 possible points. That's a 97%, that's an A. <laughs> Both publications, Spectrum and Chronicle, earn national recognition every year. So this past summer, I ran into a, formal, a former Chronicle editor. I was actually saw him in the In-N-Out Burger in the Valley, <laughs> who is now an assistant producer at 60, on 60 Minutes. And we had a great chat, which later made me curious to know, especially in a time of changing journalism, how many of our former writers, reporters, and editors are currently or recently employed as journalists. So our upper school, um, Journalism advisor Kathy Newmeyer, uh, I you know I asked her this question. And she was able to give me an answer in about a half an hour because she stays in touch with all her former editors and writers, uh, networks with them uh, throughout their lifetime. I think so. Three of her. So I'm just going to give you some some of the, the the quick feedback from Kathy. Three of her former students are currently reporters for the New York Times. Okay, more more details about one in particular a little bit later. Um, Julie Weiss, class of 96, was a reporter for a Mexico City English newspaper. Her sister Karen writes for Business Week. Jonah Friedman is managing editor of MLSoccer.com. Lucas Shaw is a writer for TheRap.com. Esther Zuckerman writes for The Atlantic. Ellie Peckman is an editor at Art News and also writes book reviews for The New Yorker. These are all kids who graduated in the last 15 years. Ariane Lang is a former, a former editor-in-chief at the paper. Uh, writes for BuzzFeed. Julia Borston is an on-air reporter on CNBC. Doug Kazarian is an anchor at ESPN. Dan Laidman was a reporter for the Daily Los Angeles Daily News, got a law degree, and is now practicing First Amendment law. Michael Kaplan, whom I saw at the In-N-Out Burger, is a, an assistant producer on 60 Minutes. Brian Goldsmith was, right, was a producer for CBS Evening News. Cody Cohen, Reuters News Service in Hong Kong, I'm almost done here, and former Chronicle Editor-in-Chief Spencer Raskoff, founder and CEO of Zillow.com, said his Chronicle training came in very handy last month when he interviewed President Obama. <laughs> so Kathy Newmeyer adds this, uh, only two of the aforementioned journalists ever took another journalism class after graduating from Harvard Westlake. So she's very proud of that. She taught them all that they know. <laughs> <laughs> I started this report by mentioning that our middle school newspaper was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize of Student Journalism. I will end with another Pulitzer Prize story. Uh, this again from, from Kathy Newmeyer. About a year ago, and nearly a dozen years after she was on the Chronicle's managing team, Jessica Silver Greenberg, class of 2000, was a finalist in the reporting category for a Pulitzer Prize. She was nominated for a business story she wrote for the Wall Street Journal, but by the time the awards were announced, she had already begun a new job at the New York Times, and her byline has been on the front page nearly every week since then. So that's a big deal. Uh, next time you pick up the New York Times, look for Jessica Silver Greenberg, class of 2000. Related to journalism, Harvard Westlake students and uh, young alumni filmmakers are collecting accolades from, or for, for their work. About a dozen student-created films have been selected to appear in six different film festivals. The Institute for Scholastic Sports Science and Medicine is a research and educational facility housed at Harvard Westlake. ISM was established because Americans participate in sports and are physically active during their scholastic age years than at any other time in their lives yet very little research has been done in pre-adolescent and adolescent athletics. Sports medicine and science research is typically conducted on older subjects, but not at Harvard-Westlake. So ISM projects are led by researchers from institutions like Children's Hospital, uh, the Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, Curl and Job, 
Uh, Harvard Westlake students work on projects as research assistants and have been cited as authors on peer-reviewed publications. ISM projects have been presented at conferences like the American Academy of Pediatrics National Conference and at a sports science conference at the Raffles Institution in Singapore last summer. So recently comp uh, completed studies include uh, a flexibility study, um, the relationship between posture and post-competition oxygen uptake, the effects of nutrition, that's always good, on, on, on uh, reducing injury and increasing uh, or decreasing recovery time. And then I thought this, this was a great one, and this was very, very appealing to our, our female athletes, bone mineral density in high aerobic demand female athletes. That was a study that was done here at the school. So ongoing studies include participation in the National Sport Concussion Outcome Study, and I'm actually going to be sending all of, all, all of you, all of our parents, um, a survey that if, you know, if you'd like to contribute to this research that we're doing at the school, it would be, it would be great, a short survey. Um, about two-thirds of our high school students play one or more sports, and the budding scientists among them are keenly interested in engaging in this kind of research either as a researcher or a study subject, uh, it brings out the, you know, the scholar athlete in them. Many of our students are actually engaged in science, were actually engaged in science research during the summer. Uh, five student scientists were awarded internships in the Early Investigators Program at USC Medical School. Two were selected from among the interns to serve as panelists in the USC Stem Cell Public Policy Education Forum in July. So that was, that was great for them. I can't mention uh, USC without saying something about my beloved UCLA. Uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM activities, are supported on campus as well. A week ago, UCLA research scientist Richard Kaner presented a primer on the miracle molecule graphene to a lecture hall full of students and then stuck around to patiently answer dozens of questions. Carbon that is 200 times stronger than steel that's, you know, kids want to wrap their brains around that. That's, that's very cool. So each spring we host a student-generated science research exhibition called STEM Fest, and this year we're going to um, do this at the middle school as well. Our middle school Chinese teachers chaperoned a group of Harvard-Westlake students participating in the World Leading Schools Association Conference in China. Uh, students from nine nations and across China, including Inner Mongolia, participated. Discussion topics included how to overcome stereotypes and how to lead in character development. And we're hoping to host that conference at Harvard Westlake next year, next summer. So a common theme uh, among these stories, our students are getting out in the world, challenging themselves, mixing and meeting and working with other youngsters from all parts of the city and all over the globe. And education is a series of experiences and these beyond the classroom experiences are a wonderful complement to our students' traditional school day lessons. Balance is key though, and while we salute our students' achievements and admire their ambition and tenacity, their resilience and perseverance, we are ever mindful of the fact that they are children and deserve to be able to be kids, to have balance in their lives. 12 years ago, we, the school, conducted a comprehensive student workload study that included surveys and analysis and committee recommendations, followed by some changes in school practice. We committed to conducting that process every six years, uh, which is a Harvard-Westlake generation, uh, which we did six years ago and which we will do again this year. So for months, we've been developing the student questionnaire and planning the analysis phase of the study in early November, every Harvard-Westlake student will answer carefully crafted questions about time spent on homework and extracurricular activities and attitudes about school, uh, attitudes about school generally, all toward better understanding their experience and perspective and adjusting practice as appropriate to serve their needs. Continuity of care which is the title of this speech, and is, as I understand it, a concept used by medical professionals to characterize their relationship with patients. It is concerned with the quality of care over time, idealized in a patient's experience of a continuous caring relationship with his or her healthcare professional. 
it's a, it's a wonderful idea. When I first heard of this, I thought, what a wonderful concept that is. And it is an idea, I believe, that should characterize our school's relationship with our students. We continuously care for them. Finally, um, it has been our practice for the past several years to introduce a character education theme or motto at the beginning of each school year and to announce it at opening convocation, which we did this year. So, you know, our, our various uh, character education themes have been the hard right over the easy wrong, which acknowledges the challenge of making good choices. Uh, it only takes one, which was a reminder of the power of initiative um, and several others over the year. The mottos are intended to be aspirational, to give voice to our values and our hopes. They give us common language, a common experience, and a point of departure for conversations about character. This year's motto highlights the importance of courage. So this is what I said to our, I'm, I'll just, I'll, I'm not gonna tell you all of it, but I'll, I'll just read a couple of excerpts. This is what I said to our students and faculty at opening convocation. I suggest that if there is a single quality that you will need to lead a good life, not necessarily an easy life, but a good life, it is courage. Courage to say yes, as in yes I can or yes I will, and courage to say no, as in no, this isn't right. This isn't right now, it isn't right ever. Courage is linked to resilience, another quality we should all cultivate. Resilient people bounce back and they bounce forward, and the bouncing forward part in particular takes courage. To lead a good life, you will need courage. The great thing about courage is that unlike innate talent or good looks or athletic ability, there is no limit on how much you can have. Courage can be developed. It is a renewable resource. If you didn't have courage the last time you needed it, you can still get some before you will need it again. Where does courage come from? The word itself comes from the Latin word for heart. Nearly 3,000 years ago, the Chinese philosopher and poet Lao Tzu expressed that link in a single sentence, four words that will now serve as this year's character motto. From caring comes courage. By going outside yourself and genuinely and deeply caring about the welfare of others or the advancement of some meaningful idea or cause, you naturally build up a reservoir of courage, which you can then tap into when you need it. When you need courage, look for it in your heart. So that's this year's character theme. All right, finally, before leaving the stage, I'd like to revisit that senior ceremony I described later. Is there one more here, JD? There we go. And, and Becky talked a little bit about this, so I won't uh, reiterate what she said, but um, there's the end of the senior ceremony, and Rick Commons did, indeed, break with tradition and rather convey a final message to the audience. He, he turned to the, to the seniors and spoke directly to them. You know, here's my take on it, though. I, it's a little bit different than Becky's. It was, it was an absolutely lovely thing to see because it was the teacher talking to students and it was a reminder of the most important thing that we do at our school. It is the remarkable quality of the students at this school that keeps my colleagues and me working here and loving every minute of it. So I will end tonight, as I always do, with a thank you to you. Thank you for entrusting us with your children and for supporting our school. Happy New Year to you all. <laughs>